Hi folks, today's presentation is going to talk about the Renaissance as it affected England, specifically how it impacted the arts and literature and things like our study of Shakespeare. Now, the word renaissance itself means a rebirth, a renaissance, and it was a rebirth of what? Well, it was classic Greek and Rome, um, specifically the arts and the sciences. Now, a lot of this was sort of spurred on by the discovery of a town called Pompeii. Now, some of you may have heard of Pompeii. It's a city in Italy that was completely buried when Mount Vesuvius, the volcano, erupted. And uh, years later, as that started to be excavated and they found people so perfectly preserved, there became this great um, interest and curiosity in what people's lives had been like in that time. And so suddenly you had all of these common folks and literature folks and uh, the scientific folks all looking back at this time period of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And this also led to uh, the uprise of a belief called humanism. And this was the idea that while the church was still very important, the church's place in the world was for the spiritual matters. The church should not not be involved in civics, that is, in the politics and the running of the governments, or in scientific matters, and that people should be thinking about controlling their own destinies rather than just accepting whatever life or situation they were born into. During this time period in England, we also saw the founding of several major universities. And these universities ran a humanities-based curriculum. That means they were studying history, geography, poetry, and modern languages, and was a place for people to go and to learn all of these things about people and about the world around them. One piece of technology that really encouraged the development of the Renaissance in England was the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg. Now, the printing press meant that there was movable type, so you could continue to make books, uh, and books, instead of having them all hand-lettered, and the books became available for everyone. When you have these kinds of mass printings available, suddenly with every book doesn't have to be handwritten, they're not quite so expensive, and books become something that can be copied and can be shared and can be made available to much more common people. This also meant that a bunch of rediscovered manuscripts manuscripts from this time, again from ancient Greece and Rome, could be copied and shared out through the universities or just through the general public um, buying and trading system. And this also allowed the sciences and the philosophies of ancient Greece and Rome to be distributed on a much wider scale, which again contributed to the Renaissance. Another side effect of the printing press was the standardization of the English language. Up until this point, people really kind of invented spelling however they wanted to, including their own names. Shakespeare is known to have spelled his name in about four or five different ways. Sometimes it was literally Shakespeare, sometimes it was Shakespeare. But if you're going to set a book and put your movable type in and then make multiple copies of these, tens of copies, a hundred copies, a thousand copies, you're going to start seeing a standardization of the language and of the English. And it also encouraged this new idea of a Renaissance man. So up until this point, you had the guilds, and everyone had their very specific roles that they would play. The Renaissance now was encouraging people to have a broad achievement across many different areas. So you not only had to be a good swordsman and a good fighter, but you also should be able to win a game of chess and write a poem to woo a lady and dance a really great dance, and also be educated in maybe four or five different languages, be able to read in Latin and Greek. So the idea of the Renaissance man is something we still use today when we talk about someone who's talented across many different spectrums. This time period was also a time of great exploration and discovery across Europe, but of course, uh, England was also very much involved in this. And if you can just imagine how much it completely changed people's ideas about what they knew about the world. If we did, for example, here, to suddenly discover that there was life on another planet, how would that change our view of our position in the universe and what we, everything that we thought we knew about science? Well, the discovery by Christopher Columbus that there was this whole continent and all of these civilizations between us and between India, uh, the Newfoundland thing that happened from the Scandinavians, the founding of the Roanoke colonies. All of these things led to a much different worldview and encouraged this idea of exploration and discovery and really challenging the status quo and what everyone thought that they had always known was true. Now, it wasn't just the scientists and the literature and the adventurers that were questioning things. 
people actually began to question the very foundations of their belief, that is, their belief in the church and the way the church was being run. There are a couple of people who were really influential in this, and I know you've studied some of them in World Civ, but they include Erasmus, who questioned the Catholic Church's interpretation of the Bible, that maybe there's more than one way to read this text. And then, of course, the famous Martin Luther, who in 1517 nailed his list of 95 theses to the door. And what he was doing was protesting, there's the word Protestant, was protesting the, uh, what he saw as the corruption in the current Catholic Church and making suggestions about all the things that needed to be changed in the way that church was done. And this was so revolutionary that it led to, as you'll see, uh, fighting for uh, really hundreds of years, if not thousands of years later, people were still fighting over some of these concepts and ideas. These ideas that the Catholic Church really needed to change completely swept through Europe. This uh, Protestant Reformation caused wars. It caused both sides to really do some pretty nasty things to each other and eventually led to the foundation of several different denominations of church. In Germany, the Protestants became known as the Lutherans after Martin Luther. In Switzerland, they followed John Calvin. You have the foundation of Calvinism. Scotland, we saw the foundation of uh, what's today the modern-day Presbyterian. And in England, eventually, we saw the Anglicans and then an offshoot of them were the Puritans who, of course, came to the United States and uh, helped to found our, our nation here. In the middle of all these sweeping changes and discoveries, you also had this really amazing little kind of soap opera happening in the middle of England. You see, you had the Tudor family who'd been ruling for quite a while, and their, uh, the newest king was Henry VIII. Now, Henry, first of all, was never supposed to be king. He was actually the second son. His older brother, Arthur, had been groomed for the throne, and Henry had always been just the really handsome, younger prince who could, you know, have all the benefits of being royal without having to do any of the duties. Well, when Arthur was killed um, accidentally in a joust, Henry all of a sudden had to take over the duties. Now, Henry was known as something of a playboy. He was in, supposed to be incredibly good looking, very much a ladies' man, and very good at the arts. He could sing, he could write poetry, he was a strong fighter, and the people just loved him. So he was very much used to being the center of the, the center of everybody's world. He was married to Catherine of Aragon, who was his first wife. Now, she was originally engaged to his older brother. The countries were trying to put this alliance together between England and Spain, and thought that this would be a great match. And when Arthur died, they said, well, you know, we still have a princess over here, and it would still be a good idea for England and Spain to not be fighting each other. So they went ahead and they married Catherine to Henry, who was somewhat younger than she was. Uh, but this went on for a, quite a long time. They were rather, you know, happily married for a royal company, royal couple. Now, Henry always had his ladies and his affairs on the side, but he was usually very respectful and, um, you know, was, was uh, kept, uh, kept good care of Catherine. But there was a little bit of a problem, because after many, many years of marriage, Catherine of Aragon had only had one daughter, the Princess Mary, who had survived. She did not produce a son. And Henry decided that this was enough of a reason to go ahead and try to divorce her. Now, divorce in those days was nothing like it was now. Marriage was considered for a lifetime, and the only reason to get a divorce was if the Pope himself gave you permission. Now, Henry also had a little bit of another reason uh, to have this divorce. It wasn't just that Catherine wasn't producing a son, but see, there was, as always, a girl. And this girl, uh, his name was Anne Boleyn, and she had appeared new in the court, and unlike almost all of the other ladies, she told Henry no. She said to Henry, I've seen what happens to the women that become your mistresses. They have this great time at court for a little while, and then you just marry them off to somebody and get them out of the way. And I don't want that to be me. I don't want that to be my legacy. Um, her older sister had actually been one of Henry's mistresses, so she'd seen this. And she said, you know what? You can't marry me, so I'm not going to be your mistress. I'm not going to sleep with you. I'm not going to be on the side. Well, Henry, remember, was this spoiled player, and he's used to having absolutely everything he wants. So his passion, his lust for Anne Boleyn, as well as this idea that Catherine was older and wasn't going to be producing any more children, certainly not the son he wanted, kind of let him get a little full of himself. And when the Pope, after many, many times, said, no, we're not letting you divorce Catherine, there's no good reason why that marriage should be annulled, there's no reason to have a divorce, Henry said, you know what, with all of this reformation in the church and all of these ideas, 
I don't think the Pope should be in charge of England. So he passed something called the Act of Supremacy in 1534, where the entire country of England broke away from the Catholic Church. They formed their new church called the Church of England, which was basically Catholic without the Pope. And he named himself now as head of the Anglican Church, granted his own divorce, shipped Catherine off, and uh, married Anne Boleyn. Now this was mostly a good move on his part. Not only did he get what he wanted, that is he got the girl that he was looking for, um, but it also made him one of the richest men in the world because now he was in charge of all of the properties and all of the monies and all of the material wealth that the Catholic Church had had. And he managed to keep that for himself in his own coffers and for using in the government. Now unfortunately this marriage with Anne Boleyn was not the happiest one and it did not end well. And Henry is most famous probably for his six wives that he had overall. And he was married married six times, managed to produce out of all of these marriages only two daughters and one son who died very young. And we'll talk about them on the next slide. So we already know about Catherine of Aragon. She was the Spanish princess who was originally married to Henry, and this was the marriage that was blessed by the Catholic Church. They lived together and were married for probably 10 or 15 years, quite happily. They had, um, Catherine had several miscarriages, but she did have one daughter, the Princess Mary, and Mary had grown up her whole life knowing that she was Henry's daughter and uh, that she was going to be, you know, married off to some rich person at some point in life. Um, when, he, when Henry decided he was tired of Catherine and when he suddenly got the hots for Anne Boleyn, and he managed to overthrow the entire Catholic Church just to go ahead and marry Anne. Um, you'd think that now he had everything he wanted. And at first, things did seem to be going really well for them. Anne was young, she was beautiful, and she immediately gets pregnant, and she immediately gives birth, which is something that, you know, Catherine had not managed to do to produce this child right away. Only one problem. She gives birth not to the son that Henry has been looking for, but to a daughter. Well, Henry says at that point, you know, we're both young. Clearly, this is what God wants from us because you got babies right away. And so let's go ahead and, you know, he wasn't happy about it, but he said, you know, we'll, we'll try to make this thing work. Well, the problem is at this point, Henry was about the only one who liked Anne Boleyn anymore. There was a whole bunch of people who were never happy at having this king. Remember, Henry had been something of a player, suddenly being their spiritual leader, suddenly being the person supposed to be the head of their church, and they really felt that Catherine was the correct and the true queen. And Anne Boleyn actually been, became known as that witch, Nan Boleyn. They thought that she had bewitched Henry. When they started to go out places, the people in the towns would boo and would carry on and Henry's advisors didn't like her and there's all this dissension and remember again Henry's upbringing he was the spoiled prince used to everybody loving him and when things really started to go bad with Anne and when people really started to like didn't like her and didn't like him because of what he had done with her he started to see her in a different light as well Things might have been saved and might have gone better for Anne Boleyn. She did get pregnant immediately again, and that baby was supposed to be her salvation. The only problem was it was indeed a boy, but it was born too early, and it died. It was born at what's called stillborn. It was born dead um, at about five months into the pregnancy. And at this point, Anne was just devastated, you know, not only by the loss of the baby, but knowing that this was the loss of her hopes. Henry took this as an extreme sign from God that he had done the wrong thing and that he should not be married to Anne Boleyn. And Anne, at this point, had a lot of enemies at court. So they trumped up a bunch of charges against her. They claimed that she'd been unfaithful to Henry. She was thrown into the Tower of London and eventually was beheaded. And uh, she became known as Anne of a Thousand Days because she was queen for just about 1,000 days, a little over three years. In there, and her daughter, um, the, the first daughter, remember that she had with Henry, uh, was named Elizabeth, and keep hanging on to that name because we'll come back to her a little bit later on. And Elizabeth was declared to be an uh, illegitimate child, and um, Henry got rid of Anne. His next wife was someone named Jane Seymour. Now Jane had actually been this young pretty thing who was a part of Anne's court. And Jane was quiet and sweet and kind of everything that Henry was looking for after all the controversy and all the drama with Anne. Jane was docile and beautiful. They got married right away. She got pregnant right away. She gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Yay, that's good. Except poor Jane, she dies of what's called childbed fever. So just a short time after giving birth, she actually dies. 
Okay, but there's a, at least there's a baby in the picture. Now, the baby isn't all that healthy at this point, but now there's a baby. So if you're following our story, Henry at this point has a daughter by Catherine of Aragon, named Princess Mary, has a daughter by Anne Boleyn, named Princess Elizabeth, and now has a son, whom they named Edward, by Jane Seymour. After all this drama, he decides he wants to try a political marriage. So he says, you know what, I'm tired of all the love and romance. Let's go and make a match that's going to be good for England financially and politically. So his advisors go out and they find this um, girl, Anne of Cleves, who's from the Germanic part of Europe. And they say, this will be a great match. It's going to bring a lot of money to the country. It's lots of great things. And Henry never actually meets Anne before they're married, uh, they do something that's called married by proxy. So they basically sign all the papers and they have a representative for themselves stand in at a wedding ceremony and do the part. So do you Henry take? And somebody says, I'm pretending to be Henry, yes I will. So they are officially married before Henry has really ever met. Only one problem, when Anne steps off the boat, according to the literature, Henry made her turn around and basically get back on. Apparently Anne was not very good looking at all. She was so hideous that Henry took one look at her. I guess she'd had chicken pox at some point, and her face was pockmarked, and she just wasn't uh, dressed in any kind of a style. And Henry was just like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with her. So he sends her back. So again, we have um, Catherine of Aragon, who was divorced, Anne Boleyn, who was beheaded, Jane Seymour, who died, and now we have another divorce with Anne of Cleves. Well, by this point, Henry is starting to look like those portraits that you see. He's been eating those chicken legs and drinking all of that meat all this time, and he's getting to be this really big guy. He's getting a little bit older, and this young girl catches, her atten catches his attention. Her name is Catherine Howard, and she's about 16 or 17. And again, according to most of the literature we have of the time, she was the classic kind of dumb blonde. She was beautiful, but she was flighty, and she was giggly, and she was this little girl. And now you've got kind of this May-December thing going on here, because Henry's probably well into his 30s or 40s by this point, and Catherine's still pretty much a teenager. But Henry is besought. He's absolutely taken with her. He says she'll make a great queen. She's young. She'll be able to have children. He marries her right away. Except Catherine, remember I said she wasn't all that bright? She has an affair uh, right under Henry's nose, and he literally catches her, or she gets caught in bed with somebody else. So that's not a great thing to happen in a queen. A queen's infidelity is considered treason, and Catherine of Aragon is imprisoned, tried, and is eventually beheaded. So where do we get the sixth wife? Well, at this point, we have an older Henry who is getting very sick indeed. He's suffering from gout, which means his joints get all inflamed. He's got all kinds of respiratory illnesses. And he finds Catherine Parr, who's actually a little older. She's a widow herself. She's well-placed. Um, and she's been acting as kind of a, has been in, in the court, so she knows Henry's children. And he, she basically becomes his nursemaid for his old age. And she manages to outlive him. So her role is not so much to have children and to, to be the, the, the bride that he's looking for and to be his hot young wife. Her role is really to take care of him in his old age and she actually outlives him. So if you ever want to remember uh, the wives of Henry VIII, the little, little mnemonic goes like this, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. And that's a little soap opera for Henry VIII and his six wives. So what happens after Henry dies? Well, he does have a son, and it's the son, you know, the father is going to pass on the crown to the son, and this is Edward. So Edward becomes the new king, yay, King Edward, except he's only nine years old, and the laws say, you know, you don't really need a nine-year-old running thing, so whoever is the guardian of little Edward is really going to be making all the decisions about what's happening. Well, there's a real power struggle for who's going to be Edward's guardians. Is it Henry's relatives? Is it his mother, Jane Seymour's uncles, who kind of get appointed in there. And at the top of this, Edward, who had never been a really strong child, was also very sickly. There's assorted rumors that he might have had leukemia, he might have had hemophilia, um, but he had something that kept him sick a lot of the times. There's even some rumors that someone might have been methodically poisoning him his whole life. But regardless of that, he dies at the age of 12. And all of a sudden, you know, it's really sad, but three years later, um, this little boy king um, is no longer king. He has died and has passed on. So now you've got a real problem, because without a clear son in line of succession, 
who's next? You'd think you'd go back to the older daughter who was Queen Mary, or Princess Mary should be queen now, but remember, he divorced her and sent her packing. Um, you might think Elizabeth, the next daughter, but there were some questions about whether or not that marriage was even legitimate. And in the middle of all of this fighting, some of the other side of the throne come in and say, you know what, we've got Lady Jane Grey here, and she's related to the Tudors, related to the, queen, to the king, and we think she's actually next in line of succession. And Lady Jane Grey was just a teenager. She was kind of a pawn in the middle of this. But the Protestants tried to take the throne at this point, and there was all of this fighting and all of basically a little mini civil war. And Lady Jane gets put on the throne and is crowned queen for a grand total of nine days. And after all this fighting revolution, uh, the other side wins. Jane is seized, thrown into the tower, and gets beheaded by, as you guessed it, coming back, Henry's oldest daughter, Princess Mary. So let's go back to what we remember about Princess Mary. Her mother, Catherine of Aragon, was queen for the longest time, and she was the only surviving child of the king. So she was brought up her whole life as the spoiled royal princess. And about the time that she's maybe around your age, her mother gets sent packing in disgrace, and she's told that she's no longer the princess, that her father isn't really her real father, that her mother and dad should never have been married, and she's kind of kicked out to the countryside. Well, this is her chance. She gets a chance to not only come back and take back what she thought was hers, but she gets to restore some honor to her mother. And remember, she and her mother were Spanish um, Catholic. And this whole bit where Henry overthrew the church just so that he could marry Anne Boleyn, Mary always saw Anne Boleyn as, you know, that other woman. So Mary saw this as her opportunity not only to take over the country and to be queen, but also to return the country back to the true church, the Catholic church. She decided to get married. She was very much in love with Philip II of Spain, who was her cousin, but he was handsome and he was young and he thought this was great and they would rule together. Well, there was one problem. The English people were very independent and Spain was one of their long-term enemies. And by bringing over Philip to be the, the married to the queen, according to the laws at the time, that meant Philip was now crowned as king. And suddenly these people in England have a Spanish king. People did not like this at all, and there were a lot of protests, a lot of carrying on, a lot of fighting, as well as the people who had now embraced Protestantism as their faith, not wanting to be returned back to Catholicism. Well, Mary decided to kind of fight back on this, and she ended up ordering the execution of nearly 300 Protestants who were connected with the court. There were a lot of roundups and tortures and burnings, and she became known as Bloody Mary, if you've ever heard that term, uh, because of the fighting, the executions that she had in insisting that the country return back to Catholicism. Now you have to feel a little sorry for poor Mary. If she had actually managed to have a child, just like her father ahead of her, if she'd had a son, things might have gone well, but she didn't. She never managed to have children, and she actually died rather young, probably in her early 30s, um, probably from something like a stomach cancer or a, a uterine cancer from the symptoms that we know her doctors at the time recorded. So now what do you do, okay? They've gone through the one boy, they've gone through the one queen, they've gone through a, a another person in the room with Lady Jane Grey, the people finally turned back to Elizabeth I. Now again, remember Elizabeth's mother was Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn was hated by the people, and she was also executed for adultery. So there's a lot of people that either never believed that Elizabeth was Henry's daughter to begin with, or thought that she was not Henry's true daughter because Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn really should never have happened to begin with. But Elizabeth was the spitting image of her father. She had her father's red hair, she had her father's good looks, and she had a lot of intelligence. And one thing that she had done was to watch very carefully her whole life the mistakes that the people had made around her. In her position, she'd always had to be very careful. So she was really smart about how she wanted to govern. And when she finally ascended to the throne when Mary died, she said, okay, one of the mistakes my sister made was to marry someone else and to give up her power. So she said, I'm never going to get married. I'm not going to do that. Um, and she became known as the Virgin Queen. Um, now, she actually may have had some lovers and things on the side and some romances. There's some interesting histories on that. But she never married, so she remained the sole regent for England. 
And she became the last of the Tudor line, however, though. And she was very well educated. Like Henry, she was very smart. She knew a lot. And she became a very strong supporter of the arts. And she ruled for so long that the entire age that she ruled became known by her name as the Elizabethan age. I mean, I'd like you to imagine for a minute that you are so strong a person and so strong a ruler that the entire age that you rule by became, becomes known by your name. We don't refer to, you know, the, the Reagan time. We don't refer to the Clinton era. Um, but the Elizabethan became the term for this entire half century of, of ruling in England. So Elizabeth's time of ruling became this golden age. She reestablished this idea of the Church of England, but she insisted on religious moderation, on this idea of tolerance. Now, she decided to be a Protestant, partially out of what she believed, but also because it was the most politically correct thing to do. If you think about it again, if she's the head of the church, she controls all of these things rather than letting the Pope, um, who's far away in Rome, take care of this kind of thing. And by allowing those people who wanted to be Catholics, who really felt you know, deeply that this was their true faith, to go ahead and flourish, um, you know, she made a lot of friends that way and stopped a lot of this fighting. She didn't necessarily promote people who were Catholic in her, within her cabinet and the people who were close to the court and to the throne, but she was very good on, on not prosecuting them out in the world anymore. And she also had a strong um, enemy at the time that she was able to rally the whole country against and to fight against the domination of the French and the Spanish. Probably her most famous um, victory here was the defeat of the Spanish Armada, uh, where the Spanish decided after, after Philip, you know, remember Philip there, who was married to Elizabeth's older sister, Mary? Uh, when, Philip, when Mary died, Philip had to go back to Spain, and he said, you know, I'd still really like to be king of England. That was pretty good. It was kind of good to be the king. And he did try to marry Elizabeth. He said, you know, I was married to your sister. Why don't I just marry you? And Elizabeth, you know, remember, wouldn't have anything to do with that. So we said, you know what? I'm going to take England by force. And the Spanish had one of the strongest fleets, the strongest navy at that time, sent over the Spanish Armada to attack, and the English... Uh, Navy was able to defeat them. And a couple of reasons there, well, there was this big storm that came up that really helped. And, and again, this was all seen as signs from God that Elizabeth was indeed the true queen and that she was a strong and capable ruler. Even though she was a female, she was able to uh, moderate this whole battle out at sea and to get this military battle. And uh, all of this time, so this established England as a strong military power. We know that they're strong and they're rich with money. And then we have all of these arts and literature and the learning and things that's flourishing during this time. So the Elizabethan age was was really a very strong time period for England. Specifically, Elizabethan poetry and drama, we see the birth of lyric poems. And these are poems that have these very song-like qualities to them with lots of imagery and lots of figurative language. And then the sonnet was probably the most popular poetic form. And they were often written about the queen and for the queen. In almost any time and place in history, when you have a time of peace and prosperity, you'll see this real uptick in the arts and in the sciences and in achievement overall. Remember, if people aren't so busy surviving, if they're not busy fighting off other militaries or they're not busy um, trying to figure out how to defeat a plague or how to keep themselves fed, they have time to actually develop these things, to invent new things, and to certainly pay attention to the arts. Under Elizabeth, we saw William Shakespeare come into uh, recognition and create this new art form called the Elizabethan sonnet. Shakespeare actually reformatted the sonnet and called it after his queen. And drama going to see live plays became the number one form of entertainment. And it became something that was available to the lowest peasant as well as to the queen herself who was known to attend the plays, sometimes even in disguise so that she could kind of go out in the streets among the people. But as they say, all good things do eventually come to an end. And after almost 50 years on the throne, Elizabeth does finally die very peacefully and of old age, having done what she said she would do, maintain power of the country, and restore it back to peace and prosperity. But now again, the country is faced with the same dilemma they had before. There's no son. Who is the next heir to the throne? Well, before she died, Elizabeth actually kind of took care of this, and she worked it out with her parliament, and she had named Scotland's King James, who was one of her cousins, to go ahead and be her successor. And James was part of what was known as the Stuart family. They were related to the Tudors, but they'd been ruling over in Scotland. So James I comes back over. Now, he's a very strong Protestant, and he's also a very strong supporter of the arts. One of King James's 
um, lasting achievements to Western civilization was having the Bible rewritten to reflect this kind of non-Catholic point of view and to be written in the language of the people of the time. And you probably have heard of the King James version of the Bible. Some of the most famous passages and quotations that you're most familiar with uh, probably are from the King James version. So during this whole time of the English Renaissance, while Henry VIII was busy getting divorcing and beheading his wives, and while the, the country was going through prince after princess after princess and finally settling in, some of the other key events that happened were that England actually established uh, several colonies over the United States, including Jamestown, America's first you know, really successful colony in terms of economics and sending money back to England. There was a lot of conflict that developed over this whole idea of the divine right of kings. So is it true that just because your daddy happened to be king, that you get to be the next king. And James and the Parliament of England were often in a power struggle, and this kind of led the way for what we'd see as the foundation of really Western democracy, um, as you saw the, the, the struggles that came through this. And we also saw the Puritans, who were a very strict sect, almost a cult-like kind of group, that came out out of the Protestant uh, Reformation in England. And they were so severe that they actually were being persecuted in England. Remember, the Anglican Church was not that much different from the Catholic Church church in terms of what they said and what they did and how they worshipped, but just that who was in charge of it. Well, the Puritans really thought church should be an entirely different matter, had a very different view on spirituality, and they became persecuted, and you probably know something of their struggles from past uh, history classes, but eventually uh, they left England and came to the New World, uh, forming Plymouth Colony in 1620 here in the United States, or what would become the United States. So as we finish up and go through reading Romeo and Juliet and looking at the works of Shakespeare, hopefully you have a little bit more idea of how this work fit into the broader picture of what the people who were going to these plays and the people that Shakespeare was writing for would have had in their minds and would have been experienced and what their worldview was like. And that's the end.